Good morning. How are you guys? Uh, for those of you guys who don't know me, uh, I'm an author, I'm a journalist, and I'm the executive director of the Flow Research Collective. And at the Flow Research Collective, we're a research and a training organization. On the research side, we work with everybody from USC, UCLA, Imperial College, London, Deloitte, Formula One. And on the training side, it's everybody from kind of professional athletes to the US Navy SEALs through the general public, through top executives. And what we study is ultimate human performance. What does it take to be your best when it matters most? What does it take for individuals, for organizations, even for institutions to sort of level up their game like never before? And if I were to put it into a phrase, if you can kind of get past the hyperbole and understand I mean this in a very practical, science-based way, my core interest is what does it take to do the impossible? What does it take to achieve paradigm shifting, nothing is ever the same again, breakthroughs? And I've asked this question in pretty much every domain imaginable, but I started in action sports. And the title of this talk is Cannabis Flow and Peak Performance. It should be Cannabis Flow and the Dirty Little Secret inside of Peak Performance. Um, and the first time I sort of stumbled upon this was on top of the Palisades. So for anybody who skis here, this is in Squaw Valley. And this is one of skiing's most iconic proving grounds. That sort of big rock in the middle is known as Beck's Rock. That's about 100 feet tall. So there are little people up top. You can put that in context. So like 1993, 1994, I got early ops with a bunch of professional athletes at Squaw Valley, which means they opened the mountain early, and it was a bunch of professional athletes and a bunch of journalists and a bunch of cameras, and we all were on top of the Palisades at 7 a.m., and it was 10 below, and the wind was blowing at 90 miles an hour, and it was a whole group of people who were about to jump hundreds of feet, right? They were gonna leap, throw their bodies off cliffs, doing backflips and everything else you'd imagine. And rather than trying to get themselves psyched up mentally, they were all huddled up in a ball trying to get stoned at seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out what the hell is going on, right? Because we're gonna do something really dumb and dangerous, and usually state change and dumb and dangerous, they don't work super well together which led me to a what the fuck is going on question that took about 20 years to answer. So I'm gonna walk you through the answer. As I said, I asked this question of what does it take to do the impossible in pretty much every domain imaginable. Science, technology, the arts, politics, sport, doesn't matter. Whenever you see the impossible become possible, one of the things that is always present is a state of consciousness known as flow. Right? You may know flow by other names. Jason mentioned a couple of them, being in the zone, runner's high. If you play basketball, it's being unconscious. If you're a jazz musician, it's being in the pocket. Flow is a technical term, scientific term, and it's technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness, one where we feel our best and we perform our best. More colloquially, it's those moments of rapt attention and total absorption. You get so focused on the task at hand, everything else just disappears. Action and awareness will start to merge. Your sense of self will vanish. Time will dilate, which is a fancy way of saying it passes strangely. So sometimes, occasionally, it will slow down. You get that freeze frame effect. Maybe you've been in a car crash. And more frequently, time speeds up, and five hours pass by in like five seconds. And you want to know where the day has gone. And throughout, all aspects of performance, both mental and physical, go through the roof. So I want to tell you a little bit about why that is and how that happens, and then we're going to bring it back to cannabis. So flow science itself is really old. It dates back to like the 1870s. That was when we first started looking at the relationship between altered states of consciousness, which is what flow is, and peak human performance. It really jumped forward in the 1960s and 70s and 80s because of this man. This is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. He's often called the godfather of flow psychology. He, at the time, he was the chairman of the University of Psych Chicago Psychology Department, conducted the largest global study on optimal performance anybody has ever conducted, essentially running around the world, talking to people everywhere you could possibly imagine, at the times of their life when they felt their best, they performed their best. And he learned three critical things about flow that are a good place to start the discussion. First thing he discovered is flow is universal. It shows up in anyone, anywhere, provided certain initial conditions are met. We'll talk about what those conditions are in a second, but what it means is evolution shaped our brain to perform its best using flow. So it is available to everybody. Csikszentmihalyi also figured out that flow is definable. It has core characteristics, and I listed some of those earlier for you. Complete concentration in the present. 
vanishing of self, time dilation. There are a couple more. And because it is definable, it is measurable. We have really good psychometric instruments for measuring flow, and we've been able to do a lot of great work here. The last thing Csikszentmihalyi figured out is that flow is a source code for happiness, for overall well-being, and life satisfaction. In fact, the people in the world who score off the charts for overall well-being and life satisfaction are the people with the most flow in their lives. After Csikszentmihalyi started doing his initial work, neuroscience started to advance very quickly in the 90s, especially in the early thousands, and we got to peer under the hood in the brain, figure out where flow is coming from and why it's coming. And you're actually looking at scans of jazz musicians on top Normal conditions, they're just playing standards inside an fMRI scanner. The bottom condition, they are in flow, doing improv jazz, also in a brain scanner. So we have really good data on where flow is coming from, why it's coming. What we learned turned our old idea about high performance upside down. The old idea, you've probably heard of. It's what's known as now as the 10% brain myth. It's the idea that we're only using a small portion of our brain at any one time, say 10%, so peak performance, aka flow, must be the full brain on overdrive. And it turns out we had it exactly backwards. In flow, we're not using more of the brain, we're using less of the brain. And the technical term for this is transient hypofrontality. Transient meaning temporary, hypo, H-Y-P-O, it's the opposite of hyper. It means to slow down, to shut down, to deactivate. And frontality is your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's right back here. Very potent, powerful part of the brain. Logical decision making, complex long-term planning, your sense of morality, your sense of willpower. In flow, this part of the brain gets really, really quiet. Why does time pass so strangely in flow? because time is a calculation performed all over the prefrontal cortex, and um, as parts of it wink out, we can no longer perform this calculation, so we can't separate past from present from future. Instead, we're plunged into what researchers talk about as the deep now. Huge impact on performance. Most of our fears are horrible things that happened in the past we'd like to avoid from the present, or scary things that might happen in the future we'd like to avoid from the present. In between, when I drop you into the deep now, anxiety levels plummet, stress hormones get flushed out of our system. Same thing happens to your sense of self. Self is another calculation all over the prefrontal cortex. It goes away, and your inner critic, that nagging, always on, defeatist voice in your head, goes silent. As a result, risk-taking goes way up. Creativity, because you're no longer doubting all your neat ideas, goes way up. We experience this emotionally as liberation, as freedom. We are actually getting out of our own way. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about neurochemistry, and then we're going to jump back to cannabis, and this is all going to start to make sense. When we move into flow, we get five of the most potent neurochemicals the brain can produce. Neurochemicals are simply signaling molecules. It's the brain talking to itself, talking to other parts of the body. Norepinephrine, dopamine, endorphins, anandamide, serotonin, all are performance-enhancing chemicals. They all impact physical function, so they will speed up reaction times. They will increase strength. They will deaden our ability to feel pain. Their bigger impact is cognitive. They surround all of the brain's information processing systems, and the result is a radical increase in a lot of core skills. These are not, these numbers have been done by tons of different researchers, so McKinsey did a 10-year study of top business executives in flow. They found they're 500% more productive in flow. The Department of Defense discovered that soldiers will learn 230% faster than normal in flow. Work done by my organization, done at USC, done at Harvard, done at the University of Sydney. We find that creativity spikes 400 to 700% in flow, and for the reasons that Jason listed, a lot of these neurochemicals, they amplify pattern recognition, our ability to link ideas together, and lateral connections, our ability to link far-flung ideas together. And we do that much more quickly in flow than normally. We also see increased collaboration, cooperation, meaning, and so forth. So we also know that flow states have triggers. I'm not going to talk about what they are, but these are 22 preconditions that lead to more flow. Flow follows focus, so most of these triggers actually drive your attention into the present moment. And yet, there is an unknown trigger, cannabis. So action sport athletes for years have been combining exercise, coffee, and cannabis into the hippie speedball, and they've been using it as a performance-enhancing chemical, right? So why is that? Well, this is your brain on cannabis. You get dopamine. 
you also get dopamine in flow. Dopamine at the front end of a cannabis high, especially a sativa high, when your brain is connecting lots of ideas together really quickly, that's dopamine. Then you get anandamine. Those are the more far-flung connections between ideas. Also kind of the openness to experience, that's anandamine. The striatum is a part of your brain that governs most of your pleasure chemicals in flow, and when we're stoned, it is ramped up to 11. The dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain on the sides here that gets really quiet in flow, guess what, also gets really quiet when we're stoned. Turns off the same portions of the brain. The ACC is the mystery, gets very active in flow, very unactive with cannabis and we don't know why. Um, and both flow and cannabis alter brain waves. Another way the brain talks to itself is through electricity and flow takes place on the borderline between what's known as alpha waves and theta waves. Cannabis will push you towards alpha. So they are mirroring cocktails. The one thing that is worth pointing out is how the real hippie speedball actually is meant to work if you want to try this at home. <laughs> so there is something known as exercise-induced transient hypofrontality. We've all had this experience. You've gone out, you've exercised, you've worked out at a gym, about 20 minutes in, the prefrontal cortex gets quiet, gets quiet upstairs, right? That's exercise-induced transient hypofrontality. Sometimes you feel your lungs expand at the same time because when that goes quiet, we get a release of a bronchial dilator. Another way to know you're in there. Once you're there, if you add in caffeine and then a sativa, you want the dopamine, you need the terpenes, you need the sativa, um, that is as close as we can get to a pharmacological version of flow. It is half of the neurochemistry, a third to maybe a quarter of the changes in brainwave function. Just to give you an idea, a lot of the tech that is out there saying, oh, this will drive people into flow, it's tweaking one thing, making it similar to flow. Cannabis naturally tweaks six things and makes it similar to flow. It's as close as we can get pharmacologically to flow in a pill. And that is a lot of the work we're now doing at the Flow Research Collective. We're trying to take this farther. We're trying to look at, does cannabis, does THC work better than CBD? We've teamed up with UCLA on a research project on that one. Bunch of other questions. We're at the front end of this, but it is really a revolution in human performance tucked inside the cannabis industry. So thanks for listening. It's been fun hanging out with you guys.